Good afternoon. So no questions for Mark, you guys are going out. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, uh, I'll keep you awake. I'll be my, my goal for, for this presentation. But uh, I wanted to focus on uh, ethical guidelines and CCR and you know, cold combustion residual rule and really talk about uh, the challenges of meeting both of them uh, relative to uh, timelines, relative to requirements, uh, and really the benefits of, of looking at this holistically. So um, as a whole, I guess I'll just do kind of the, the boilerplate Duke Energy overview, uh, talk about some key industry trends, a lot of them we've already discussed today, so I'll go over those pretty quickly. Uh, touch briefly on the CCR and inflow guidelines, just as far as the rules and rulemaking. Again, the others have covered it uh, uh, really well already, but just to hammer those points home. And then really what I want to focus on are the impacts and the challenges related to those impacts. And then hopefully have a, enough time for questions if you guys are awake enough to pray. Um, so again, I want to go through all this. This is kind of boilerplate for Duke Energy today. Um, overall, we're one of the largest utility in the United States. Um, I look at that, and you know, you might ask the question, well, what does that mean? You know, I, for me, it doesn't mean I'm big. You're supposed to pay attention to me. It really means that we have a diverse fleet. Uh, I think one of the benefits of work is produced is I deal with challenges in the Midwest, and I also have to deal with challenges in Florida and Carolina. So each one of those regions presents its own set of challenges. So again, we have uh, plants that are all built under different utilities. So we really get a variety, and it you know, keeps it interesting. Also, it's able us to get kind of a big picture and, and see some of the, the trends and challenges that everyone really faces. You know, our, our, our mix, you know, generally, we're about a one-third, one-third, one-third. So, Look at where our energy comes from, where our customers get our energy. It's about one third nuclear, one third gas, and one third coal. Um, you know, that really only tells one picture. Really, is if you look at the Indiana region, we're heavily coal in, in Indiana, but in Carolinas, we're pretty balanced. In Florida, we're heavy gas. So again, if you look region by region, we're not so balanced. Together, we're nice and balanced, but again, there's those regional challenges that we have to deal with. This is probably an eye chart. Sure, everybody in the back can read this really well. Um, but you know, kind of focusing on the key in, uh, uh, top items. You know, really, this is our uh, key industry trends. Our six big challenges that are faced uh, that Duke Energy faces. Really, all utilities facing today. You know, number one is what we'll focus on today, and really focus the conference is environmental compliance. But we also have a number of different things that, again, we're going to discuss today. Natural gas prices. You know, certainly in the availability of natural gas is, is a big, big driver. You, know, you certainly see the trend. Uh, you know, hard to see, but you know, through the 2000s, we have a pretty violent uh, gas trend. Now it's looking really flat. You know, to the point where you can buy three dollar gas five years from now. You know, really, which if you had told me that five years ago, I would have said, "Yeah, you can't do that." But uh, I certainly see it. Uh, demand growth or a, a lack of demand growth. You know, so really seeing flat load growth. Some of that's due to energy efficiency, some just due to the economy. So certainly dealing with that. You know, an aging fleet, uh, nuclear and coal. So obviously we're dealing with you know plants that, that continually need more work. I mean, think about fuel efficiency and efficiency for coal plants. You know, you're talking about looking for a four to six percent efficiency gain on a 50-year-old coal plant. I mean, that's a tough, that's a tough plot. Um, increasing in uh, distributed generation, we didn't talk really much about that today, but again, you know, the solar and its penetration in our grid is, is a big deal. You know, certainly changes our, some of our paradigms of our industry. And then the last one, new technology. You know, obviously, um, regulations and business pressures bring on new developments, which again is a good thing, uh, but certainly there's things that we need to look at and adapt to. So really those are our six key trends, but again, I'll focus on number one being environmental regulations and you know, the focus of my talk is really related to water and waste. And, uh, I know a, a lot of discussion today has been on clean power plant. And, you know, when I look at that, and, you know, we, we kind of try to plan for that. A lot of that's outside the fence. You know, so you know, to me, it's outside the power of water, outside of the, the plant operators. What does it mean to them? Not, not, not a whole lot when you think about the building blocks and how it works. You know, water and waste really to me are kind of the new inside the fence challenges. 
you look at really the next five to ten years, I see it's going to be another transformative thing, similar to what we've seen in air over the last 15, 20 years. The next ten is going to be the water and rains. So with that, we show this. This is a slide that we kind of call the compliance black mark. So really what we're saying is, is that, you know, in the last 20 years, like I said, we had a lot of error regulations. So we did a lot of bad controls, scrubbers, SCRs, things like that. But what happened? Did we destroy the pollutants? No, we didn't. What we did was we moved them to the water, we moved them to the waste. It went one way or the other, depending on the control technology that we decided. You know, through our process, it may shift from the water to the waste or may shift from the waste to the water. You know, really, it's a matter of where is it best suited. And really, when we look at a holistic challenge, we're really trying to find, hey, we want to move it to the best place. Again, as a, as a whole, and a general rule for us, we always say, well, we want it to be stabilized in the waste. And you know, that's, that's where we ultimately want it. So this is a, another uh, slide to try to illustrate that point. If you look at air, and really, um, you know, the number of air regulations that we've had in the last 15, 20 years, what was the result of that? Now, this is kind of your basic power block. Everybody's seen that. Everybody should be familiar with that. But if you look at it, I, I put in these little chemical, you know, files here, files to show you where we are adding chemicals. We've got a number of chemical companies come up here today and talk about chemicals. I think some of those represented that. So to me, some of those regulations, we either added controls or added chemicals or did both. So you see all this, we got chemicals. We got chemicals everywhere. So to me, I, this kind of brings up this picture. I'm sure if you all are Christmas vacation fans. You know, this is kind of what it is. It's really a bolt-on, a bolt-on, a bolt-on. Do we look at this as a holistic approach? You know, really, if we if we would have looked back at the last 15 to 20 years and had to comply with all the regulations that hit us throughout that time, would we have done it the same way? And I'll tell you that we probably wouldn't. There have probably been things that we've done differently. So for us, we're trying to understand. We've got to look into the future and see what what that future may hold, and try to build in a staged approach. You know, and if you can do that, again, you're going to find a balanced set of levers, if you will, and it ultimately you save customers. So for us, when you think water and waste, you know, we're really looking at three main areas. Um, the first is the coal combustion residuals rule or the CCR rule. Uh, again, I won't go through the details of this. Many of you are familiar with it. It was published uh, April of this year, so just, I think, about a month ago almost exactly. Um, Effluent guidelines, again, final rules expected in September. And then uh, stricter permits, you know, so for us, it's not just, and for everyone, it's not just the federal regulations, it's also the regional and the state regulations that we get hit with. So on the water side, we're seeing ever increased lower limits, more scrutiny, internal alcohol limits, things like that on our new permits. So before I go from that slide, if you look at basically what the timeline looks like, the, the next 10 years, what does it look like? You know, really the, the next challenge, you know, outside of any, you know, outside permit, limits is truly the reroute of streams from our ash ponds. So again, CCR rule is likely going to close all of our ash ponds, and we're going to have to reroute all those process streams. They need to go somewhere. And then next after that, you know, shortly after that, it's going to be ethical guidelines. So you can see, if you didn't look at this holistically and didn't pay attention to both, you could easily narrow in on your silo and look at one, and oh, nope, now I'm done with that one, i got to do this one. So again, we're trying our best on so real quick on the CCR rule, you know, just as a quick summary, you know, the CCR rule as far as existing impoundments, um, there's four areas of requirements. And the way to look at this chart is, is that if you can meet all of these requirements, and these are a lot of words that we're throwing, but if you can meet all of those requirements, you can continue running your ash, you just continue using your ash bases, you know, from now until whatever. I will tell you these uh, criteria are incredibly strict. And for us, and I'm sure the entire industry, we don't expect to continue operating any of our ash ponds. It's really just a matter of when they will be closed, not if. Um, you certainly could retrofit an impoundment, uh, again, but by the time you, you know, do that, clear all the ash out and put in the liners and the location, to meet, try to meet location restrictions and remediate groundwater impacts, you probably, that, you probably wish that you didn't. Uh, so again, our focus is to, to get out of the ash pond business 
But again, it's just a matter of when. Uh, I'll tell you uh, from Duke's perspective, I don't think that there was any requirements in the CCR rule that were surprising other than the timing. So for us, the timing requirements or some of these requirements were a big surprise to us, uh, specifically some of the 24-month and 36-month requirements for process reroutes, which I'll touch on later. Um, Ethical guidelines real quick. I've always shown this slide because it's kind of the way I think about water compliance. Um, so hopefully you, you can catch up with my thought process. But uh, really there's three main areas that you have to you know, think about and what ultimately leads to what your permit looks like. And one of them is water quality um, uh, standards. So these are human health, agricultural, aquatic life, uh, and any local or regional standards. Uh, one a perfect example being here in Chicago is the Great Lakes Initiative. You know, all those come with their own set of criteria. There's also, also anti-degradation measures, which essentially are related to the, the water source that you ultimately are discharging to. So again, it's are you uh, uh, are you affecting that over some diminished level? Uh, and then the last one is the ethical guidelines. Again, as the folks from East Kentucky Power went over earlier, this is not a new rule. It's a revision of the rule that was passed, revised in 1982. But essentially, this is setting you know, your technology-based limits or the best that you should be able to do or the federal standard. Um, so again, depending upon your site, one or the other or all of them could be controlling measures in your permit. Um, so the way I kind of show that is, is that, hey, you might have a water quality standard for, say, mercury, and it's this level. Anti-degradation may say this level. But then ethical guidelines will trump it all because it's lower. So again, it's the lowest of any of those three that's ultimately going to set your discharge permit. Again, my last point is this is going to vary by site, and it certainly makes it a challenge sometimes. So what's the impact of these two rules? Uh, again, when I look at this as a typical pole plant, I like to say no pole plant was ever made the same. Uh, I love the term sister units. You know, we like to say they're identically different. Um, but uh, this is kind of a, a generic station. Generally, everything drains to the ash pond, and that's generally a lot of our sites are like that where you have bottom ash sluice, low volume well, low volume waste, so that's some strains, things like that, uh, leachate, you know, your FGD water, all gets kind of collected in that ash pond. You know? Well, why is that? Well, one of the things that I think is a big aha for a lot of us, and hopefully the industry, is that that ash pond, you know, it's not a purpose-built structure. It's kind of built to fit its land. You know, it's, we had 50 acres, and this is, we made it this big. You know, it wasn't really designed as true, a true process design step. So it, it, takes a, it takes a lot, it's a big buffer. You know, so when you think about flow variations and things like that. So if you take that away, now you've got all these streams to deal with. And then you add in ethical guidelines, now you've got all these internal outfall limits that are set based upon technology standards. So you know, you have to meet all those little worm stars and then you've got to collect all of them and then be able to meet ultimately the red star which is still your MPDS permit. So again, how do you collect all those different streams to, to a point and be still be able to meet your discharge permit limits and continue operations? So to me, it's a big challenge. And the big challenge comes from all these streams are very different. And I kind of use the fruit You know, I got, a, I got a, you know, apples and oranges, right? I got apples, oranges, bananas, and grapes. I got all different kinds of fruit. You know, bottom ash transport water, it's got a lot of solids on it. It's got a lot of bottom ash. A lot of bottom ash settles pretty quickly. And then once it settles, you've got water that looks a lot like the source water. That's a pretty relatively clean water. Again, because bottom ash just really isn't that reactive. You don't pick up a lot of the salt solid. You know, so to me, that's kind of like the apple. Um, the kiwi really is the, is the FGD wastewater. And others have covered that pretty well. It's a highly variable chemistry. Again, it's whatever's coming out of the scrubber. And, we're not, we're not doing what marks yes and have a good pretreatment. Those things can vary pretty widely, depending on the fuel that you're burning, depending on operations. You got high, high TDS in that water, relatively high dissolved metal concentration. Again, with, and with that point guidelines, you're going to have very, very low limits. Uh, again, it's, it's a challenge. Um, landfill leachate, again, another group. Highly variable flow, highly variable chemistry, depending on how you're landfilling your solids. Also, weather dependent. Are you in a rainy season? Are you in a rainy area? Um, again, do you have a lot of landfill left to cover, or do you cover it as you go? A lot of this determines what ultimately makes up landfill leaching. Um, low volume waste. 
Again, the highly variable flow can be very high in TDX, you know, depending on the rain event. You can pick up a lot of mud and whatever else. And again, operations dependent for low-lying waste. You know, are you washing down air heaters? Are you, excuse me, washing the plant? Are you in an outage? All those things can vary, can vary wildly. And then stormwater, you know, highly variable, highly variable TDS, again, weather dependent. Also, it's very sightly, stormwater is. Is, it, is your plant built kind of up on the hill and everything drains away from the plant? Or is your plant built in a hole and everything drains into the plant? That can certainly depend on what is ultimately contact stormwater, which can be a huge challenge when you talked about burying and dealing with these streams. Um, bottom edge treatment options. Uh, Again, I'll run through these pretty quick. I think uh, UCC is doing a presentation tomorrow, which will not a lot of these, but you know, we can certainly use some impoundment. Again, this is the ethyl guidelines, and then we can build an impoundment uh, that meets CCR requirements, all those four load up restrictions. But you can still use that. Um, mechanic, we call kind of mechanical wet transport, which would be more of a uh, drag chain conveyor type system uh, where you have the dry material on the backside. You know, again, you could resurf that water if you treat it to a certain level, or you could um, actually discharge that water. Again, those are two options in the ethyl guidelines. I, I'm not sure which way those go, although I keep hearing that it's not going to be allowed. Uh, but again, you can still discharge it. And then, or you can go completely dry, so get the water out of the system entirely. Uh, MGD water. Um, I'll say, you know, when you look at ethical guidelines, when you look at where the money is going to be spent with ethical guidelines, um, certainly FGD water is going to be the focus. Um, it's the most difficult water to probably deal with and treat on just a chemistry basis. Um, I gave this slide, I gave this slide, this is basically a cut of everything that Duke has to treat FGD wastewater. Um, certainly, seven ponds, uh, phys chem treatment uh, that's been talked about. Uh, we have a biological treatment as well for selenium removal. You know, certainly, um, you know, for our plants, you know, our base plan would be uh, you know, more of a chemical precipitation plus biological system. Uh, we also have the thermal ZLD or vapor compression evaporation, um, and then uh, solids fixation as well. Uh, again, that would be where you're making more of a deposit tech type materials, uh, cementitious type process. Um, again, those are the snapshot of what Duke Energy has for them, but obviously there are a lot of other technologies being developed. I know Mark discussed them, uh, discussed uh, uh, RO, there's certainly a bunch of concentration technologies, what I call them, uh, being developed and pursued these days. Um, also, a lot more uh, effective biological treatment designs that have been uh, coming out lately, so a lot of activity in this area, uh, as you would expect, given that I just told you that that's where the money's going to be spent. Uh, really, the other processes um, is the last one. So the other fruit left over. Really, you're talking about this replacing this ash pond that provided all this buffer. You know, really, it was a buffer for the back end of the plant. The big buffer was flow equalization. You know, dealing with those peaks and the process flows, and then your you know, storm, your big storm events. So how do you deal with those? And the example I have is we've got a lot of water balances lately, and we have one plant that the peak flow, process flow for the plant is about four to five MGD. If you add in a 25 year slope event, it goes to 14 MGD. So how are you going to deal with that one event that you have to design, with, that one that might happen <coughs> in 25 years, again, required by our permit to meet, um, becomes a big challenge. So we, we kind of look at it as this spectrum. You know, we look at it as we, uh, a passive option or an active option. A passive option is really a fancy word for a pump. You know, we're really just looking to replace that retention that we had in that ash basin with a per what I would call more of a purpose-built retention basin. So looking at the volumes that we need to hold and then designing that basin to hold those particular volumes. The other step of the spectrum is true active. So this would be the actual you know, clarifiers, filter presses, that type of thing, active treatment. Obviously for us, passive treatment would be great. You know, again, we're not talking about big operational impacts. It's not going to take operators checking it every day. It doesn't need to be tweaked, controlled, what have you. It's, it's definitely a hands-off type of system. That's why they call it passive. The problem is footprint. You know, we've got our sites obviously have been packed with environmental equipment that was never originally in the site layout. We've got ash ponds that all need to be closed over the next five to ten years. Can't build on top of those. 
So where are we going to put a purpose-built pond? And I'll tell you, that's been a big challenge for us. Um, again, not, not something that happens pretty easily at our sites. So, you know, for us, when I look at these rules and, and just kind of laying out those challenges, you know, what are the keys to what I call the holistic approach? When I look at this, you know, for one, we got to have a tuned-in crystal ball. You know, we have to have regulatory, without that crystal ball, we have to have some sort of regulatory circuit. But you can say we're on the cusp of that. We've got CCR that's finalized, that's signed, sealed, delivered. F1 guidelines are coming in September. So that's still, what is that, four months away, four and a half months away? So we should have that by the end. Well, the problem with CCR rule is I only have two to three years to, to do my process rerouting. So for me, I can't wait for four months. I've got to make decisions now. I've got recommendations to do next week. So again, that's, that's a challenge for us. Sufficient time, again, two to three years to reroute process rules per the CCR rule is not near enough time. For us, you know, we think five years minimum. Again, there's a lot of things as we talked about. We've got ash pond closures, we've got you know, we've got uh, ethylene guidelines requirements to try to integrate, and then oh by the way, we still have to operate the plants. So again, big challenge. Um, co-management, co-treatment. Uh, again, uh, I think East Kentucky Power talked about uh, the co-mingling and co-treatment and the benefits of that. You know, not just on the reuse side, but also being able to optimize our systems. You know, for us, you, if you remember all those orange stars. I only have five different treatment systems that all basically look very similar. I would like to be able to co-treat if I can. Again, that's kind of key to be able to minimize the equipment and ultimately uh, you know, minimize the impact to operations. And again, the last bullet, just hitting the home, we need enough time. Again, really, the CCR rule is a huge surprise for us in that two to three year window. It just is not enough time. So just a final word, again, next five to 10 years are really gonna be transformative, you know, fundamentally change the way we operate our stations as far as water. You know, the loss of the ash ponds is a big deal. I can't say that enough. It's a huge tail end buffer. Um, you know, internal outflow limits is gonna increase our demand on the processes, also sampling and, and, and it's huge impact on operations. And then, you know, really, you know, all these, uh, New treatment systems are going to increase our operating costs. That's an obvious statement. But again, if we can find ways to integrate and co-treat, again, we're going to minimize that overall impact. Um, and again, if our my final word here: coordination uh, with all these new regulations is key to this optimized approach. You know, really to to get us through the whack a mole knot and ultimately end up with a, a, a good optimized approach, which to me is is good for everyone. So that all.
be able to buy the healthy industry, there's going to be some flexibility in there because, again, it's a value. So. Yes, sir. Right there on the left. Matt, John, you with BMW, um, you know, you just got done saying that you know you don't have enough time. The two to three year window is going to be a challenge. So the rules are already in place. You have to meet that requirement. Yes. So what do you do as an organization? So you're you're currently setting the priorities, looking at the looking at the key plans and addressing those first. In other words, okay, given that that you don't have the time, how are you trying to handle that? That's a great question. Um, you got any ideas? Uh, <laughs> now, um, it, you know, the key, the key part of the CCR role, you know, the, the key, key one is structural integrity. Um, that's the one that drives the two-year schedule. So for us, uh, you know, after our Dan River incident, we did a significant investigation of all of our ash ponds and did basically all the structural integrity analysis. So we have that in, in our back pocket. I think we're ahead of some of the industry on that. I think TVA has theirs as well, but I know others are going after and trying to get it. So we have a feeling for where we stand on structural integrity. So that's got a lot of drive to what is ultimately going to be a two-year schedule versus a three-year schedule, which three-year schedule is driven by the groundwater impacts, which again, we're not expecting a significant portion of our system to pass. Um, so again, it's uh, that two-year, three-year, our approach is to do everything as fast as we can. There's a number of people in this room that I call all of us every week that I'm asking them. We're, we're throwing stuff together. We're, we're trying to come up with something uh, that works. Um, the, the best answer I can give you is we're going to do the best we can. Are, we, you, are we, you doing that internally? Yes. Or are you using outside resources? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, yeah. I know there's a number of engineering firms in here. I'm pretty sure we've got all of them under contract. Other questions? Just two. One more question. Thank you very much for the opportunity.